First of all, let's get you some breaking news coming out of Gabon, where soldiers have taken over the national radio station. They've criticized President Ali Bongo Ndimbo, who's been out of the country for medical treatment since October. Ali Bongo recently addressed the country in a New Year's message from a hospital bed. The message to the head of state, Ali Bongo Ondimba, is that the debate on his health has reinforced doubts about the president's ability to handle the heavy burden of the responsibilities of his office. The homeland has given us everything and made us the people we are. We cannot abandon it. So the patriotic movement of youth of the defense and security forces, in order to preserve the integrity of the country, has decided to take responsibility to stop the ongoing moves to seize power by those who, on the night of the disputed election in 2016, killed our young compatriots with the support of illegal and illegitimate institutions. President Ali Bongo has been in power since 2009. Before that, his father, Omar Bongo, ruled the oil-rich nation for more than 40 years. The first obvious question, Nicholas, is what is going on? Is this a coup? Well, Sami, it appears like at least it's an attempt to remove Ali Bongo or the Bongo dynasty, like you mentioned, that has been in power for over half a century out of power and this is led by young military soldiers young officers um, that, that took over the national radio station early this morning while people were listening to the morning news um, members of the presidential guards took over the radio held journalists hostage and read this message to the people of gabon in this address they call this operation dignity uh, in this uh, operation, they're calling for ordinary Gabonese, young Gabonese, to take up arms, to take control of police stations, government office, in order to ensure that these presidential guards can remove Ali Bongo out of office. Now, they've called for the installation of a transitional council, for a return to democracy. what led to my encounter with these creatures you call dog man and the man whose spirit was so dark that he was able to control them first you need to understand what happened to my family why well, I left America and went back home to my native country Gabon and the most important thing you need to understand is why you have to leave these creatures alone so a quick history lesson I'm gonna take you back it's the night of February 17, 1964. My grandfather and 150 military officers start and successfully pull off a coup d'etat, taking over the Gabonese government. Of course, the question that comes to mind is, well, why would your grandfather do something like that? Now, I wasn't alive back then, but from what I've been told, they wanted independence from the grip of the French globalist government that had taken over Gabon and they wanted to negotiate a trade deal that would allow the country of Gabon to use the natural resources in a way that it saw fit a way that would benefit the people and not the French government mainly the oil reserves understand a free Gabon free from a political and economic arrangements with the French government overnight will become the economic powerhouse of West Africa it was when that thirst that hunger for freedom began to boil and bubble up. That rumors started to spread. The Gabonese legislature was going to put everything to a vote. And if it passed, it would free us from the control of the French government. But before they could vote, President Mumbai dissolved the legislative branch. And it was that one decision by the president that led to the actions of my grandfather and 150 other men that night of February 17, 1964. President Mumbai was sent into exile and Jean Abbott was installed as president. 48 hours later, 
the French government discovered the coup, and with the use of military force, they reinstalled President Mumbai. It is here at this point that things take a turn for the worse for my entire bloodline. My grandfather was sentenced to 25 years hard labor. During the time of his sentencing, my grandmother was pregnant with my father and his twin brother. However, Mumbai was ruthless in his punishments, and the wives and children of everyone involved in the political coup were exiled to the bush. Imagine going from being the wife of a respected military leader to a peasant living in squalor overnight. Those were the conditions under which my father was raised. And with no way of supporting himself, he turned into the illegal oil refining business. In fact, my father was a pioneer. He made enough money to have a family of his own and support his mother. But it was dangerous work. And when he was 25 years old, his brother died in an explosion body consumed by fire. Then two weeks before my grandfather was to be released, he was murdered in prison. The word came down to our family that they were never going to let him go home. They just wanted to destroy him, give him hope, and watch that hope drain out of him as he laid there dying, bleeding out on the floor. Now, I was told that it was the death of my grandfather that spurred the decision to send me and my sister to America. And understand, before me going back home, all I knew was life in America, a place where a poor exiled boy from Gabon could go to school, join the military, and get an education. And I tell you, it would have been nice if the reason for my return home was a joyous one. But instead, I was asked to come home because my father had suddenly fallen ill. According to my mom, he got sick on June 6th at exactly 6 p.m. He was walking around as normal, fussing about the boys, making noise in the streets, when suddenly his eyes glossed over and he began to sweat. Then they rolled into the back of his head and he started convulsing. His, his body was knocked to the ground as if some invisible force pushed him down. Imagine being ill. One day you can walk and you can talk. The next day you can talk but you can't walk. And then the following day your legs work but your arms don't work. This illness that plagued my father seemed both natural and supernatural. Honestly, I didn't know what to expect when I arrived back in Gabon. I had seen pictures over the years of where my parents lived. That little village that I described to you in the brush had slowly took a life of its own and become a small town and then a city. Understand, it was nothing like the cities on the coast of Gabon. But at the same time, it was no longer just living in a brush either. Fields with palm trees ran everywhere. People driving on roads, small houses spread about. These were the dissidents, dropped in the middle of nowhere, giving nothing, and they had built an entire life for themselves. And it was amazing to see, especially knowing that my people had absolutely no help in developing it. At my father's house, I was greeted by a young man, 20 years of age. He smiles and says, your father would be happy to see you. And he was. Even though it was hard to look at him, his 50-year-old body looked 70 years old weak and frail but my mother looked strong and she hugged me with tears running down her face for almost 10 minutes it was not long after we separated from our hug that that young man introduced himself to me as Axel pulled me outside and began to explain to me what he thought happened to my father my father's power had grown in that town people looked at him as their leader sort of an unofficial mayor the people started discussing the building of a Christian church. And according to Axel, that's when all the problems began. Father had a meeting with the local witch doctor, which in turn led to them having a huge argument. Axel told me that he believed it was him, that witch doctor that put a death curse on my father, using some of the most powerful blood magic. You see, around the same time they had that argument, two children went missing from the town and when Axel and the other men of the town went searching the brush looking for the children they reached this area where the magic was so strong shadows of these huge wolf-like creatures could be seen walking on two legs now pause for a second because I need you to understand something there's a huge difference between Gabonese culture and American culture they both have forms of witchcraft magic and conjuring the difference is in America, 
You see, in America, it's obvious that people are not educated in the ways of the occult and dark magic. So they fall victim to magic and dark forces that are openly on display. And by being openly on display, it makes it even more powerful. But in Gabon, my people have knowledge of dark magic, cannibalism, ritual sacrifice, blood curses. Axel went on and explained to me that this particular witch doctor was extremely powerful. He came from a bloodline of all witch doctors. They had handed down to him many secrets and he was initiated into the old rites, old magic that had been around before the great floods. Understand, this man had eaten his own big toe, something that was only done as an initiate to the highest order of black magic. We sat there for hours as Axel broke it down to me. The only way to truly heal my father was to kill this man because he was draining my father's life force. Now let me pause here again for a moment. I had basically been back home for the first time in my adult life. And this is what was awaiting me. The prospect of black magic and murder. Listen, it was too much for me in the moment. So I told Axel, listen, let me sleep on all this information and I'll get with you in the morning. Later that evening, I'm sitting at the dinner table with my mother. And she tells me the exact same thing that Axel did. But she elaborated more. She told me that seven days after I was born, she had this dream that her son would be a warrior in a foreign land. Then come home to save the entire village. My mother told me that before I was sent to America, that father had me blessed in this ritual. The same one he went through as a boy. A ritual designed to make a boy grow into a leader amongst men. You listening to me right now, each and every one of you have a mother. Do you remember a time where you saw your mother stressed? I mean, completely and totally stressed out. That's what I was seeing on my mom's face. Later that evening, she fell asleep with her head on my shoulder. And looking over at her, I can see. This was probably the first time in a long time that my mother had an opportunity simply to rest and be in peace. But later that night, my dreams were invaded by him. No one had told me his name, but somehow I knew it was Umboa, the witch doctor. He stood there in my dream looking at me, smoke rising from incense that burned in his hands. Skinny, skin black like thunderstorm clouds, eyes all white, the bones of children's fingers tied into a necklace around his neck. In my dream, this man spoke to me. Prodigal son, your father has no wealth, no health. I rule the spirits of the four winds. Go back to America before I kill you as I have killed your father. Listen to me. When I awoke from that dream, I knew this man was evil and he had to be killed. Morning comes and I awaken with a resolve unlike no other. And upon finding Axel, I tell him, we're going to find Umboa and we're going to kill him. His reply was that he needed about 24 hours to gather two men, weapons, and then we would head out into the brush. So I spent the rest of that day at my father's bedside with my mother, comforting him and talking to her. I don't know what you would call it, maybe it was mother's intuition, but she knew I had decided to go after Omboa. Looking me straight in my eyes, she said, son, if you're going to go after him, you must be brave. He feeds on the fear of men, women, and children. However, if you are brave and remove all fear, there is nothing that he can do. The next morning we departed. Myself, Axel, and two other men headed into the brush. AK-47s glistened like swords on their back in the early morning sunlight as we walked deeper and deeper into the jungle. Understand, fear is defined as an unpleasant emotion caused by the threat of danger or pain. And terror is defined as extreme fear. There is no word in a dictionary that describes the feeling I had walking into the jungle. I served in Afghanistan, lost friends, took fire, but this 
this was death was more than just being in physical danger. They got problems on problems on problems on problems on problems on problems that solve them. I run through the money, the press will be calling. Left on my blessings, I feel like I'm falling. The birdie is back. Tell me I'm garbage, I'm going through something. That's why. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Dog Waters, busting you across the head with another phenomenal Dogman encounter. For the record, this is one that was supposed to come out during the last Dogman weekend, but I wanted to do more vetting on it, just like I wanted to do more vetting on that Afghanistan Dogman encounter, and I'm digging deeper into that one. I've gotten to the point where I'm comfortable with releasing this, and so, bam, the bullet's out the barrel, and it's coming for you guys. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, also, we're doing a deep dive into Fort Pierce. I've spoken to the second witness, the young man that lived with Blue, young lady that lived with Blue, man, lady, it's a man, young man that lived with Blue, and uh, his personality is different than Blue's personality, so it's a little, taking a little bit more for me to get them, get him to open up and, and speak, but I'll get there, trust me, I'll get there. In the meantime, I'm going after another person in Fort Pierce that's going to give us the history of the area. That's going to give us the history of the area and everything that happened and centers around there. So we're going to keep on digging deeper in the Fort Pierce. It's not one of those things where you do a one-time interview and, okay, goodbye, and that's it. We're going to dig into this and find out what the hell is going on. Deep dive, seriously, deep dive into this neighborhood, deep dive into this area. We're going to figure this one out. We're going to figure out why I was there. We're going to figure out why Blue still is seeing those things there and if anyone else in that neighborhood is seeing it. Again, this is your boy, Dark Waters. If you're not a member, head on over to imdarkwaters.com. It's $4.99 a month and become a member. If you are a member, all I can do is tell you, baby, I love you and I thank you. And again, if you're not a member, all I can say is, what the hell is wrong with you, man? We got the best, baby. We the best.